name is Nick. My office is in CB. Two five zero. Okay, the deets all these details should be in the course handbook. And you will and you do have access to copies of these slides as well okay so for any notes and things like that if you want to print out the slides and then write notes that's great remember anything I write in these slides will also end up on Sakai otherwise if you need to get a hold of me my email address N I C H O L A S full stop my surname S P E A R M A N at vits.ac.za. Okay. No, you may not have my number. Shall we begin? That was rhetorical. Okay, chapter 20 is the, the introduction to chapter 21. Macroeconomics, what's it about? Well, let's first recap quickly. What was microeconomics about? Remember, we just looked at basically the decisions that ordinary people, as well as businesses, the decisions that they made, so their choices as individuals. In other words, how does one person decide how best to allocate their budget to various different consumption needs? Macroeconomics, okay, cool. We're still interested in people. We're still interested in fir uh, businesses, except we call them firms now. So now we're looking at not people as individuals, but people as crowds of individuals. We're looking at businesses as if they were many, many businesses. We also add in things like government. And then we want to treat the economy, the entire economy, essentially, as if it was one thing. Okay? So now instead of just individuals, we're talking about the aggregates. Why is it important or why is it different to think about macroeconomics as groups of things versus individuals? Well, remember, we had something called the fallacy of composition. What is good for the individual is not necessarily good for a group of individuals, right? Fallacy of composition. So where did this all come from? Well, obviously, economics, in as much as we teach it, we're talking about a Western tradition here. So when we talk about academics, I guess these are Western academics, but Scotland is where it all begins. And... Uh, this guy, Adam Smith, writes The Wealth of Nations, and what, what he's trying to understand in this treatise is how is it that nations grow, okay? Why do they trade? Is there any use to trading? And how do the people within a nation get richer, okay? So these are the sort of questions that now people in uh, 18th century, 17th, 18th century Europe are starting to question. And they come up with an idea which, broadly speaking, becomes known as classical economics. And classical economics kind of develops over about 200 years until around the 1930s. Okay? And in the 1930s, you have in the U.S. something called the Great Depression, which also sort of comes across to Europe, except Europe it's very different because, remember, Europe had the First World War, then they had a big mess, and then they had the Second World War, and then they had another big mess. So... There was just a lot of mess happening, whereas in the U.S. you had something called the Great Depression. So the Great Depression, you have a problem because businesses are going under and people are turning to government to say, what can we do about this? Right? We need solutions. We need some kind of coordinated action. 
And unfortunately, classical economics over here, the stuff from 200 years before, was kind of, well, didn't have much to say about it. Uh, classical economics said, well, if you leave it alone, it will kind of sort itself out, right? So the story from the classical side of things was, look, things might get messy in the short run, but in the long run, things will turn out okay. And then Keynes comes along in the 1930s, and he's a bit of a smart guy, you know, and he goes, yeah, look, cool. In the long run, things might all be okay, but in the long run, everyone's dead. So why don't we do something in the short run, right, while we can, as opposed to just letting things be, okay? So he comes along with this thing called the general, well, what, gets beco what becomes known as the general theory. And so as we talk more about this course, we're kind of going to, we're going to get involved with some of the ideas from both aspects, and we're going to bring them together, see how they work together, how they're different, and the current state of thinking about how economies operate. In terms of that discussion, there's going to be a couple of things that we focus on. The main thing that we're going to focus on is economic growth, okay? So if we're dealing with macroeconomics, this is a big thing. How do we grow an economy? So all the stuff that an economy produces, we use the letter Y to mean output, the stuff that we produce. So if we're talking about growth, we're talking about delta Y, change in Y. Okay? Why do we care about having more stuff? Well, because, I don't know, people want more stuff, right? It's just one of those things. And in order for people to have more stuff, we need to produce more stuff, we need to grow. Closely related to questions of growth are questions of employment, except what we're going to focus on is unemployment, in other words, people that are not employed. Why is that important? From an economic perspective, people are resources, and they need to be working in order to be producing output. So if we want to grow, if we want to produce output, we need people to have jobs. If we want people to have jobs, unemployment is a bit of a problem. So unemployment is one of the things that we will focus on as well. Inflation. Inflation is change in prices. P is the symbol that we use for prices. So delta P, change in prices. Why do we care about inflation? Well, inflation <coughs> or change in prices means that whatever we're producing when we take it to market and we try to sell it, we need to understand something about what we can sell it for. In other words, what is the price level that we're going to sell it for? Bearing in mind that if we produce something, we need inputs into that production process, and those inputs come with costs. So prices matter in the sense that if they're changing, our input costs are changing, the price at which we're selling things is changing. So if we want to make decisions about what to do, especially if we're doing, making forward-looking decisions, if there's a lot of uncertainty about what prices are going to do, that feeds back into our decision-making process and adds a lot of uncertainty to that process. Okay? In other words, if it costs me 100 Rand to make something, and I make something, it takes me six months to make it, and all the input costs cost me a hundred rand, I take it to the marketplace in six months' time, and I can only sell it for 50 rand, well, that's a bit of a problem, right? So what the way that prices are changing matters to how I make decisions. So it matters for economics. Then something that we're going to add that we didn't speak about in microeconomics was government. So when we spoke about microeconomics, when we introduced it initially, the assumption was that markets were perfect. Perfect competition. Perfect information. Right? No frictions. No costs to trading. We then took it a little bit further once we got familiar with that idea to describe situations where maybe markets weren't perfect. So we have things like monopolistic competition, right? With product differentiation, monopoly, different kinds of market setups, okay? 
So the question, of course, is if markets are perfect, if markets are perfect, then they allocate resources very well. If they're not perfect, maybe they don't allocate resources very well. But if markets are perfect, what is the role for government? Why would we want a government? So at this point, what I'd like you to do, we're going to do this frequently, so get used to this. Get a piece of paper and uh, a writing utensil and put it in front of you on your desk. Okay, so having equipped yourself, what I want you to do is just take like 30 seconds quickly, what do you think we need a government for? Why is government useful? Chat to people around you and then I want your feedback. So quickly, 30 seconds, write down like two reasons why we should have a government. Okay, thank you. May I get some feedback, any brave souls? Hands up and then shout something out to me, like, yes. Okay, you think subsidies is a good idea. Excellent. Okay, so subsidies would be to something like farmers to make them produce food. Especially if there's a natural disaster. Okay. I like that idea. Yes. Okie dokie. What about law enforcement and regulation? Nice. Okay, anyone else? Keep it coming. Yes. Okay, so there are certain types of goods that perhaps are not going to get produced in a market situation. Maybe the government could uh, step in. What kind of goods did you have in mind there? Anything that you can think of? defense force right so the government should be in charge of the defense force as an example right police force as well okay yes so communication so government has a role in communication I like that okay so let's go with those for now we got Communication, the production of goods that perhaps are not going to happen unless the government is involved, right? Maybe there's no economic incentive for the private sector to produce these goods. There's law enforcement and regulation. And then related to this idea of uh, goods production is the idea that maybe government should be diverting resources from some sectors and sending those resources to other sectors through means of subsidy. Now, I guess subsidy could be in a number of ways. You could, as you suggested, subsidize farmers if you want food. Another kind of subsidy might be social security in the sense that you take the income of some people and distribute it to other people as a kind of a living subsidy, right? Uh, and I think that those are all really, those are really good suggestions, yes. 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 Absolutely. There's a lot of uh, differing opinions about whether governments should be subsidizing anything at all, right? and what the impacts are, in fact, of a government's interference in any market, right? In other words, what you, what you do have is, for example, very heavy subsidies towards farmers in France. So French farmers get very big subsidies to produce. 
They produce a lot of goods. They don't get sold in Europe. There's not a big enough market for those goods in Europe. So whatever's left over gets put into big ships and taken across the ocean to North Africa and dumped there and sold at very low prices. So then you have African farmers in the north arguing, hang on a minute, we cannot produce our goods at a price that's low enough to compete against your dumped goods that you're selling at basically giveaway prices because you can't use them where you are. Maybe you should stop subsidizing your farmers, right? They would produce at much higher costs they would produce less, we would be able to produce more, and in fact, we might even be able to export and then build up our own economies rather than having your stuff dumped on our economies. <clears throat> so it's a fantastic kind of debate to have. What is the role of government in things like subsidies? But as soon as we bring government in, yes, we get these super exciting questions. What should government be doing? Should government be taxing some people in order to subsidize other people through things like social grants? Should that happen? If it should happen, why should it happen? On what grounds? What is the basis for your argument? Right? Yes. Something about equality. Okay? Is equality important? It is? Okay? What we would want to do is we would want to go out and say, right, if we think equality is important, we want to get evidence of this. Right? So the economic process, if we want to get involved as an economist in doing these sorts of things, is we want to deal with the kind of statements that we've been talking about here. Right? Should we subsidize farmers? Okay? If we should, why should we? And if we come up with a reason why, do we have evidence for that being a reason why? Right? And that's kind of the policy space that we deal with. Very exciting stuff. Unfortunately, this is first year, and we don't get to do much policy stuff. But if you get involved in all your ECOs, first year stuff, you, you like what we talk about, third year, honors, masters, degrees, Policy stuff is right there, right? It's very, it's very important in the South African economy. There's not a lot of very informed debate about how things should be happening. So if you want to get involved in a space that's very exciting in the South African economy, there's a lot of space to get involved in. So why should we have governments? Let's just say that this is a very debated position. Okay, any questions at this point? 